This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 106, continuing the history of the six-day races, running as far as you can in six days. This episode will tell the story of the first major international first-day race that took place in England in 1878 and was later called the First Astley Belt Race. It was a major deal. Now to the story of the great six-day race. Six days, because it was never on Sunday. By 1878, interest in ultra-running, known as pedestrianism back then, had taken a strong hold in Great Britain. The six-day race was viewed as a unique new branch of the running sport that fascinated many sporting enthusiasts. Like P.T. Barnum, who was the first major promoter of ultra-running in America, John Astley became the first prominent ultra-running promoter in England. Astley's significant involvement in 1878 helped to legitimize ultra-running, and he was the person who put running into ultra-running. He thankfully removed the walking restriction in the six-day race. Sir John Astley was a member of Parliament. He grew up in a wealthy family and served in the 1854 Crimea War. He was a great sportsman and, while young, was an elite runner at short distances. Astley was truly a larger-than-life character. He was a big, burly man, fond of strong language and strong drink. It was said, Wherever he went, he was made conspicuous by a large figure, white hair and a beard. The enormous cigar never out of his mouth, save when he was eating, drinking, or sleeping. He had a strident voice and frequent boisterous laugh. A friend said, quote, He must have smoked more miles of cigars than any man living. Astley also had a passion for boxing and wagering large sums of money. Championship belts had been introduced into boxing as early as 1810, and Astley brought the belt into the sport of pedestrianism. On December 8, 1877, Astley announced that a six-day championship race would be held in the Agricultural Hall in London, open to all pedestrians in the world. A perpetual belt valued at 100 pounds would be awarded to the winner. A telegram was sent to the recognized world champion, Daniel O'Leary, in Chicago with an invitation. O'Leary quickly responded that he was interested. In January 1878, more detailed plans were announced for the historic event. The date was set for March 18th with a prize package of 750 pounds. The field would be limited to 20 starters. But the most significant announcement was that the race would not be limited to heel-toe walking. The athletes could run if they wanted. It was called Go As You Please. What he did to encourage competition was change the rules from walking to go as you please. So pedestrians could do whatever they wanted. They could run, walk, crawl, whatever, just to get around the track. Now, the Astley Belt races were really the golden age of pedestrianism and the greatest race series of all time. All right? And, and I mean, it was like national pride was at stake here. It was international competition. It was more talked about than the weather. It was a really big deal. The decision to open up the competition to running was made for two reasons. First, Edward Payson Weston was constantly criticized that his walking style of wobbling was not true heel-toe walking. This put pressure on judges during events and caused anger among wagers. Second, in recent decades, the British had been developing running, not walking, and were at a clear disadvantage to Weston's and O'Leary's skill at walking. Go as you please would level the playing field for the British. O'Leary believed that this was the true reason. It was deemed as necessary to invent a style of progression which would place the legitimate champions at a decided disadvantage. Even the British press admitted that this was true. As the long walk has developed of late under transatlantic influence, the good old English long run is still the better animal. Competitors would be allowed to, quote, walk, trot, run, lift, or introduce a new style of pedestrianism if clever enough. 
But some still believe the way to win the six-day race was to walk, not run. Objections to the planned event were voiced by some thoughtful sportsmen. Recent ultra-distance accomplishments were referred to as, quote, insane feats of endurance that ought not be encouraged. Others were cautious, but less critical. Of all athletes, the peds seem to be most active now, walkists and runners being in great requisition all over the kingdom. By mid-February, some British entries were coming in. Would the most famous pedestrian Edward Payson Weston enter? It was pretty clear that Weston had no intention of entering, as he continued to put on his own walking exhibitions in England, including trying to walk 1,500 miles in 26 days. He did apply, but never paid his entrance fee. He later gave a lame excuse of illness and presented a doctor's note as proof. The New York Times properly speculated that Weston was afraid of O'Leary. On February 25, 1878, O'Leary arrived in New York City on his way to London. He boarded the steamer Idaho along with his wife and child. He tried to do walking training on the ship, but the weather was too rough to allow much walking. A committee was formed to manage the event of, quote, numerous members of the aristocracy and all the titled supporters of the national pastime of the turf. Two tracks were laid down, one 12 feet wide, seven laps to a mile to be used by Englishmen, and another track six feet wide, seven and a half laps to a mile for foreigners such as Weston and O'Leary. One corner of the hall was fitted up with 20 small huts for the use of competitors and the attendants. The huts were said to be in terrible condition because they had recently been used to stable camels for a circus and they smelled awful. Boo! You stink! Rules were put into place. Each competitor is to be allowed one attendant who may hand his man refreshments at a specified part of the track. The penalty for a competitor willfully jostling or hindering any of his opponents or making use of bad language will be disqualification. Switching directions on the track could be done at the end of a mile if wanted. The winner would be awarded a four-foot-long silver and gold challenge belt weighing five pounds with silver and gold plates. The start of the Great Six Days Tournament took place at 1.03 a.m. on March 18, 1878 in the massive gas-lit Agricultural Hall in London. Astley first made a short speech for the 18 competitors lined up in front of the grandstand and then shouted, Away you go! Some competitors started running fast, others jogged carefully, and O'Leary started out using his proven style of walking. It was a strange sight as they settled down to their work, the 18 men in their varied costumes, some walking steadily, some trotting, some running, some in groups, others individuals. George Hazel, age 33 from London, was an experienced champion 10-mile walker and had been competing for eight years. He was described as having, quote, a bulldog face, short, cropped hair, and almost deformed, stooping shoulders, which gave him the most displeasing appearance. Early on during the race, Hazel tried to use some brash, trash-talking tactics against O'Leary. He was walking in the opposite direction of O'Leary. When he passed the Irishman on each curve, he would verbally challenge O'Leary, attempting to get him upset. On one turn, Hazel said, I'll kill this wonderful man before I am done with him. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Are we running over? You're cheating. <laughs> As Hazel gained the lead, it caused O'Leary to worry, and he started running, which alarmed his handler, Albert Smith, who begged him to stop running. O'Leary said, Leave me alone. I know what I am about. After 90 minutes, Hazel was still ahead of O'Leary by a mile or two. This really bugged O'Leary. He couldn't stand this bitter, slouching, personal competitor. Therefore, he vowed to beat him. 
Hazel was warned by judges that he would be disqualified if he continued his unsportsmanlike behavior. He soon slowed significantly without the breath to continue trash-talking O'Leary, and he was the first to quit the race, reaching only 50 miles, far back in 15th place. Hazel retired in disgust and contempt for the new order of pedestrianism. In the coming years, Hazel would change his mind and became one of the greatest six-day runners ever, the first to break the 600-mile barrier three years later. After 12 hours, O'Leary pulled into the lead with 66 miles, but was closely followed by a runner called Corky. William Corky Gentleman, age 45, was a vendor of cat food from Bethnal Green, England, and had been a pedestrian for more than 25 years. He was given the Corky nickname because of his, quote, lightness on the path. He was shorter than the others, 5 feet 4 and 114 pounds. During his cat food deliveries, he ran on his rounds. In the races, he ran stooping over with an awkward gait and a sad look on his pale face. One person described him, A frail little lightweight, the last you would select to go over 500 miles on foot in a week, but who seemed to skim over the ground with lightness of an Italian greyhound. On day one, Corky was the first to reach 100 miles. As the miles piled up, most of the competitors had given up attempts to truly run. O'Leary had slowed to a trot since midday. After the first day, the score was O'Leary 117 miles, Corky 113, and Vaughn 102. As the second day began after midnight, only O'Leary and two others were on the track during the wee hours of the morning. He felt anxiety to have some strong runners so closely behind him. He boosted his mileage to 124 miles before taking his first sleep rest for two hours. By dawn, he held a nine-mile lead over Corky, who was crewed by his wife, who never left him day or night during the race. She was always ready to hand her sweetheart a basin of delicious and greasy eel broth that he loved so well, which evidently agreed so famously with him. That's gross! Blower Brown soon moved up to compete for third place against Vaughn. Of all the competitors, Brown was seen running the most often. Henry Blower Brown, age 34, of Fulham, England, was a bricklayer who during his working days would run wheelbarrows up and down planks. He had been running competitively at distances of up to 10 miles for 16 years. He was described as, Plucky and persevering, this wonderful little man has a place exactly modeled somewhat after the reputed speed of a pig, an animal which is popularly supposed to go just a little further than anything that tries to catch it. In the years to come, he would break the six-day world record. At the end of 48 hours, the score was O'Leary 200, Corky 190, Brown 188, and Vaughn 184. The group of four had a big lead over the rest of the runners. As day three started, O'Leary took a three-hour nap and then returned. He walked very slowly, but soon increased his speed to a steady walk of a little better than four miles an hour. While he had been sleeping, Brown had pulled within three miles of him, but then needed to take a break. Corky, suffering from pains in his legs, gave up second place and rested longer than anyone else. Henry Vaughn was moving up. Henry, or Harry Vaughn, age 29, was a carpenter and architect from Chester, England. He was nearly six feet tall, thin, and walked very upright, with a long stride. Vaughn began his walking career eight years earlier, when he won a two-mile race. Vaughn, the recent 100-mile walking world record holder, had been the pre-race favorite among the betters, five to three odds. Betters on Vaughn stood to win a staggering 100,000 pounds if he won. That's worth $16.4 million in today's value. Halfway through day three, O'Leary was at 240 miles with a 10-mile lead over Vaughn. Unfortunately, Vaughn was suffering from sore feet. The press was amazed how many British runners were having troubles with their feet. 
Surely in training for a 500-mile walk, either the pedestrian or his trainer ought to be able to discover which sort of boots or shoes are the most suitable. Had proper care been taken about this small matter, half of the men would not have been crippled. At the end of day three, the score was O'Leary 288, Vaughn 270, and Brown also at 270 miles. Corky, who had been with the front runners in the early days, had fallen off dramatically. On day four, the press was getting bored. During this afternoon, the attendance of the walk was increased, but proceedings had been most monotonous. On and on, on and on, on and on. However, they were fascinated with the reaction of the thousands of spectators. In an age of sensations, and now that the rage for pedestrian feats is at its height, it is too much to expect that spectators will immediately grow tired of such displays. It was surprising to many that running did not seem advantageous over walking. It is very remarkable that O'Leary was kept very constantly to the walking pace, whereas those who have done the most running do not seem to have gained anything by extra speed so attained. Vaughn continued to press O'Leary's lead. At the end of day four, the score was O'Leary 373 miles, Vaughn 360, and Brown 337. By 11 a.m. on day five, O'Leary passed 400 miles, but his lead over Vaughn was only 13 miles. Vaughn was walking well, but with continued sore feet. O'Leary was said to wear an anxious look on his face. Vaughn, the Brit's remaining hope for victory, reached 400 miles about four hours after O'Leary. The announcement on the scoring board being received with loud cheers, which were repeated when he was shortly afterwards presented with a handsome bouquet trimmed with the national colors. During the day in London, a false rumor spread that something was wrong with O'Leary, which caused a rush of spectators to come to the building. They were clearly favoring Vaughn, but they were alarmed to see their hero with his bruised feet wrapped in cotton wool. He strained every nerve to replace the gap between himself and his adversary, but although he had frequently trotted short distances, O'Leary held his own. What about all the others? Most of them had quit, but some in poor shape continued to try logging miles. Several were in a very pitiful plight as regards to their feet, and it seemed positively cruel to encourage them to keep on their legs, struggling against nature, perhaps doing themselves permanent injury. Most of the competitors presented a forlorn, destitute, ragged, and even dirty appearance. Their guernseys and running drawers looked as if they had not seen soap and water for many weeks. Their boots were hanging to their feet by shreds. Abject poverty seemed to be settled in every countenance, and most of them looked as if they were walking for dear life. Vaughn on the outer, longer track used a strategy to match O'Leary on the shorter track, lap for lap, and follow him closely to close the gap. But evidently O'Leary disliked racing side by side, and every chance he got would suddenly reverse his direction after a mile to try to get away from Vaughn, but usually his shadow would follow him. Go away! Late in the evening, many thought Vaughn would catch up to O'Leary. O'Leary said, Vaughn is a gallant walker and a good square fellow. We watched each other like enemies, but there was no feeling of envy or anger. Vaughn's friends were by far more numerous. When they handed him bouquets, he would pass them over to me to smell, and on the next turn I would hand them back. The wild applause for Vaughn had no effect upon me. By 10 p.m. the hall was densely crowded. The mob shouted whenever any two men got near each other, apparently oblivious of the fact that one was in reality 100 miles ahead of the other. At the end of day five, the score was O'Leary, 457 miles, Vaughn 441, and Brown 416. The fourth runner, Ide, was 65 miles behind Brown. As usual, the building was cleared of spectators for the night, but for the last morning, many remained lined up outside the building to make sure they did not lose their chance on getting back in. 
O'Leary slowly plodded along the track for several hours during the wee hours of the morning, while Vaughn and Brown rested. This has enabled O'Leary to obtain such a lead that nothing less than a total collapse can deprive him of victory. He finally retired, but told his trainer to wake him up the moment that Vaughn reappeared on the track. By dawn, his lead was 24 miles. As morning advanced, the crowds began to pour into the building, and notwithstanding that there were other competitors on the track, eyes were strained and lungs were used only for O'Leary and Vaughn. Go it, Vaughn! O'Leary's leg began to swell and cramp. He looked worn out and no longer held his arms forward, but he refused to leave the track for any rest, fearing that if he did, he would not be able to start walking again. For eighteen straight hours, he never left the track for one second. His legs swelled to twice the normal size, was stiff, but he felt no significant pain. At 2.47 p.m., he reached 500 miles in an immense applause, setting a new world time record for that distance. By late afternoon, there were about 14,000 people in the building. High above the gallery, some adventurous youths had perched themselves in the girders, and once or twice it seemed as if there would be a ghastly accident. A shaky scaffolding in midair was also tested in its utmost limits, but happily with no fatal or otherwise unpleasant consequence. In the late stages, O'Leary had a 19-mile lead over Vaughn. When Vaughn reached 500 miles at 7.38 p.m., he quit. O'Leary continued until 8.10 p.m., reaching two laps over 520 miles, breaking his world record against Weston by a quarter mile. His backer Smith insisted that he stop. In his wagers, his backer Smith won a staggering 20,000 pounds worth $3.3 million today. O'Leary then retired to his tent. There was tremendous cheering and the band played See the Conquering Hero Comes. Brown and a couple others continued. O'Leary went to his dressing room, quickly escaped from the mob, and took a cab for his hotel. Vaughn came back out, supported by his trainer and attendant, and walked a lap on O'Leary's track. He received cheers from hundreds who had not been able to find O'Leary. At 8.32, the mob broke in and swarmed all over the course. It might be said at the invitation of the band who played God Save the Queen. At that point, because of the chaos, the race was declared finished. The next day, hundreds of visitors tried to see O'Leary, but he declined to see anyone. The swelling in his leg went down and his feet were not blistered, but he suffered from chafing and needed to sleep. Within a week or two, O'Leary was eventually awarded the challenge belt. It included seven oblong squares, three by two inches of solid silver with embossed edges. The centerpiece was made of solid gold with raised letters that read, Long Distance Champion of the World. On the left silver square was a figure of a runner, and on the right was a figure of a walker. O'Leary later remarked, They put the runner ahead because they wanted him to win. The reaction among the British was mostly positive. The tournament has from first to last been a great success, and no pedestrian event has ever received such patronage from nobility and the general public as has this one. The event took in more than 3,000 pounds of gate receipts, valued today at more than a half a million dollars. After Astley paid out prizes, rent, gas, salaries to the judges, timekeepers, police, and other staff, he netted a profit of about 741 pounds. Major credit needed to be given to Sir John Astley for organizing this historic event that opened the door to the golden age of pedestrianism. But was it totally fair? It was pointed out that O'Leary had a track to himself while the other 17 had to jostle and struggle on the same track. Certainly during the early days, this created a disadvantage for Vaughn because Vaughn had to pass so many runners on the outside, it was estimated that he walked 12 to 15 miles more than the distance he was credited for. Also, 
Compare O'Leary's comfortable tent with the wretched pigsties of the other competitors. They were more like dens for breeding malaria than places where the weary might rest. One man wrote, On Friday night, I was taken to the hut occupied by Vaughn, and the stench was simply unbearable. The floor was liquid mud and ammonium deposit. Uh-oh, stinky. Certainly equal arrangements would needed to be provided in the future. As usual, there were plenty of negative reactions from the event. From London, it was written, One of these days, when one of these poor fellows, dazzled with the distant prospect of gold, drops down dead on the track, science will be satisfied, sport appeased, and public indignation aroused. Their requiem will still be the wheezy brass band and the hollow cheers of the crowd. Astley and the British did not want the extremely valuable Astley belt to leave England and argued for a week that it needed to stay. But Astley eventually relented because there had been no published rules regarding where the belt had to reside and let O'Leary take it with him after he left a 100 pound deposit. After another visit to his homeland in Ireland, O'Leary returned to America and arrived in Chicago on May 19, 1878, with the Astley Belt. America honored O'Leary as their hero. New York wrote, The feat accomplished by O'Leary is the greatest on record, and one in which every love of manly exercise may take satisfaction. Chicago added, we congratulate our wiry little O'Leary upon the splendid exhibition of a Chicago brawn and brain that he has made, and that he has beaten the Briton in every class of exercise for which the Brits have always been famous. Stay tuned for more six-day race history. <laughs>